Kei aku nui, kei aku rahi, te nā koutou katoa. Ko te mea tuatahi e mihi kauana ki te uh, kingi Māori, kingi tuheitia, pōtatau, te whero whero, te tuawhitu me tōna whānau pai Māori ki a rātou. Uh, tuarua, me mihi ki a tātou mate huhua o te wā, te hunga mate haere ki te hui o ngā kahurangi rātou ki a rātou uki uki mai, uki uki atu. Uh, ngā mihi ki a koe e whetu, uh, mō tō mihi whakatau, hei whakapai tā tātou hui e te ata nei, uh, ki, ki aku whānau, no Ngāti Tipa, Tūranga Waiwai, ngā mihi aroha ki a koutou. Ki ngā tāngata, kua huhui mai, hui hui mai te ata nei, uh, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Um, it's good to be here today um, amongst colleagues and whānau, who I didn't actually expect to see here today, wonderful to see. Um, and friends and to see um, the faces of those who have sat with Nidia in some form over the last 10 years and before that the Population Studies Centre. Um, I'd especially like to acknowledge Fetu for starting our hui in the right way, thank you Fetu. Um, our current director, Professor Francis Collins, our founding director, Professor Natalie Jackson, from whom I learnt so much. Um, our emeritus professors who are the Ruduhi and Koroheke of Nidia, um, Professor Ian Poole, who will be joining us later on, Professor Dick Bedford, um, da uh, Dame, uh, uh, Professor Dame, it's so hard when you've got so many titles, Professor Dame Peggy Koopman Boyden, <laughs> um, and uh, Professor Jacques Pote, um, our esteemed emeritus professors. And of course, our Ringawira extraordinaire, Shafali, who managed to organise all of this. Um, and produce a video, which you'll see later, and she doesn't look flustered at all. I don't know how she quite pulls that off. Um, my whānau from Ngāti Tipa, wonderful to see you here. Fano from Tūranga Waiwai as well. Um, Dr Ngāhuia Dixon actually worked previously here at this university, and I remember very clearly when I gave my job talk to get my position when I first started at NIDIA in 2010. After I gave my talk, I was very nervous, and she stood up and said something like, if you don't hire her, you're idiots. Um, so, ngā mahi whaia ngā huia. Um, so, ka mua, ka muri. This is, I'm not sure why this isn't, this isn't turning up, but I've got this beautiful picture that sits in the background, actually, of my whānau and Ngāti Tipa that I'm doing research with on a Marsden grant outside our whare. I'm not quite sure why it's there, but hopefully the rest of my slides will turn up later on. But today I really just wanted to take this opportunity, since we're amongst colleagues, friends and whānau, to reflect on this theme of ka, uh, ka muri, ka mua, ka muri. Sometimes this is interpreted as, as walking backwards into the future, or that we should look to the past uh, to inform our future. From a Western perspective, the past tends to be seen as, as behind us, um, and one's goals and aspirations relate to the future which is ahead of us. Uh, from a Māori worldview, the past and the present are knowable. Ngā wā o mua, the words used to describe the past, literally means the time in front of us. So we do not leave the past behind. Rather, we carry our past with us into the future. And when we as Māori talk about the future, we invariably talk about our relationships with our mokopuna. Wakatu Incorporation, for those of you who are purveyors of fine wine and like to drink tohu wine, Wakatu owns tohu wine. Um, they're a wholly Māori owned corporation, one of the largest landholders in Tetewihu in Nelson. So they have a 500 year plan. That is not the average business plan, called Te Pai Tafiti. So when they're talking about their mokopuna, they're talking about their uri, their descendants yet to come. And that's the vision, the long vision, that I think we need here in Aotearoa. So it is this dynamic interplay of the past, the present, and the future that means we can talk simultaneously and unproblematically about the ancestors that we carry with us and the mukopuna that are yet to be born. 2100 seems too far away for some. You go too far out and the data gets dodgy. Are there any population projections people here from stats? <laughs> there must be a few. Kim Dunstan? Somewhere? <laughs> um, so demographers like precise models um, and the reduction of uncertainty or the quantification of uncertainty 
and going too far out in the future becomes too blurry. But we cannot and we must not be contained by our models. By focusing on the immediate and on even the intermediate, we can forget to turn our attention towards the long-term economic and demographic challenges that we surely must face if we want a land for our mokopuna. In 2100, my youngest will be nine, my oldest will be 92. <laughs> well, that seems so old. And uh, my youngest will be 86. And I did go and check the period life tables, and her um, expected uh, life expectancy at age zero was 77 years. So I'm rooting for her. They will likely have mokopuna, perhaps great mokopuna. And when I think of these mokos, mokos, the questions that arise are not how many people will live in Hamilton in five years' time or what would the ethnic composition look like in 10 years' time. These are all, I'm not minimising these questions. They are very important for planning and other purposes and decision-making. But when I think of the long durée, the question I ask is, what is a legacy uh, that we wish to live, wish to leave? What do we want for our mokopunas, mokopuna, here in this place, in Aotearoa? So I, I want to reflect a little bit on what it means to carry our past into the future from the specific standpoint of an indigenous demographer in this land. And in some ways, I can't think of a better time to do this in a post-COVID context. We've been through a rough year. More than 2.6 million people globally have died. Many have lost their livelihoods. Um, the economists will like this. Working hour losses, well, it's not good news, but it's precise news. Working hour losses in 2020 were approximately four times greater um, during the pandemic in 2020 than during the global financial crisis in 2009. The pandemic has laid bare inequalities that we cannot and must not ignore. There is an appetite for change, of some have dubbed it the Great Reset, to recover from COVID-19, to build healthier, more equitable, more prosperous futures, to be greener, to be smarter, to be fairer. I'm sure you've all heard some of these mantras along the line in the last year. The United Nations, of course, has the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm sure someone will talk about them at some stage during the day. And recently supercharged these with its call for urgent solutions for urgent times, focusing on climate change, poverty, justice, human rights, and gender equality. Here in Aotearoa, we know we're lucky. We're fed much better than other countries in terms of the direct effects of the pandemic. But we know that the economic effects have been far from even. For far too many New Zealanders, nothing could be worse than a return to, norm to normality. So in these times, it's important, I think, to have a population lens and a long lens. And I feel privileged that I can be part of NIDIA um, as the country's only population institute that can provide a sort of leadership to surface conversations about our population futures and have those hard conversations. It's important too to have a population lens that is interconnected, to not just focus on the local, but to be able to situate that in the global. We are at a critical inflection point for people and for planet. By 2100, we will see the end of global growth. By 2075, the number of older people aged 65 years and older will outnumber children for the first time. This is globally. Ah, oh, that shows up, that's great. <laughs> Um, so you can see in these graphs that project out to 2100 uh, by the United Nations DESA. Uh, these are the most recent world population projections. And the median rate projections, just over one-fifth of the world's population will be aged 22% uh, on the right-hand side, aged 65 years and older by the turn of the century, and children will comprise around 18%. So that transition from um, more older people than younger people will happen before the end of the century. World population will continue to grow significantly, but the vast majority of that growth, over 90%, will be concentrated in the countries and groups that currently have much lower levels of income and access to resources. The 21st century will mark the end of the, the, the demographic transition, the process by which populations move from high fertility, high mo mortality and stable population, through to low mortality, low fertility, and stable population. And when this happens, as it's theorised to do around 2100, global growth will stabilise and then decline. This trend will hit the most developed countries first. Of course, if Natalie, uh, Dick, and Ian have written about extensively, it's already happened in many countries, um, and, and will happen later for those countries that are less economically developed. There will be tremendous 
across national and regional variation. There is no one size fits all policy response to this. So while we need to be, have an eye to the, global, uh, to the global trends, we also need to have granular um, and deep knowledge about what is happening in our land. There will be complex interactions and tensions between population, planet and resources that we must grapple with. And if the COVID has taught us anything is that um, we have strong interdependencies um, that we have to deal with. We may be able to lock down our borders temporarily, but we can't unplug from the global economy. So what does this mean for Aotearoa? In recent years, there's been a narrative about unprecedented, unprecedented disruption. And in some ways, this is true, but in other ways, it couldn't be further from the truth. As I learned from an, our Nidia Emeritus Professor, Ian Poole, in 1997, I think, when I took the POPS 201 as an undergraduate here at Waikato University, um, our population size, but especially our structure, is the product of past dynamics and past transitions. We always carry our past with us. Transitions in fertility, mortality, and migration that underpin the Aotearoa now had their genesis and changes decades ago, and much longer than that for the Pākehā population. Sub-replacement fertility and high rates of net migration, these are not new. These didn't just happen. The concept of age structural transitions, uh, which Ian has studied in depth, is fundamental. As he has shown in key publications, population age structures almost always display a complex and time-varying pattern producing age waves that have policy implications that defies a one-size-fits-all approach. I like this quote, demography will matter in the century, not by force of numbers, but by the pressures of waves of age structural change. Shout out to all the demographers in the room. <laughs> um, but I don't want to lose the other people who are here, so I'm not going to talk about too much demography. That's not the point of this talk. Over the last decade, Natalie Jackson's important work on subnational population change has shown that the onset of depopulation begins subnationally in the places where we live. Her work has unpacked a new form of subnational depopulation, a popula depopulation arising from net migration loss and natural in decrease in tandem. And she has shown that age selective migration is causing many areas to age far more rapidly than they would from the demographic transition alone. Natalie's important work on the Māori demographic dividend has also shown that young Māori and Pacific peoples will play an increasing role in determining Aotearoa's economic future, and that a far greater level of attention needs to be inv and investment needs to be forthcoming in the education, training, health and wellbeing. But that demographic grace period is closing and to a large extent has been wasted. And it's really Māori driven initiatives like Puhoro STEM Academy, which develop an indigenous centred approach to supporting Māori kids into STEM related fields, and Ngai Tahu's Tokuna Teraki, the Māori Futures Collective Initiative in the South Island. These are the ones, these are the models that are really offering new models for change. Now I just want to um, talk a little bit here about. Oops, I'm going to stay here for a little bit. I don't want to. I don't want to move too quickly. Um, about demographic transitions and here in Aotearoa, the transitions we've had here have been very, very different for Maori and Pākehā populations. Um, differences in the timing and the drivers and the pace of change. We know, for example, there was no such thing as a Maori baby boom. Uh, Māori still had high fertility. The baby boom was a peculiar Pākehā experience here in Aotearoa. When Māori fertility did decline, it happened quite late, and it was spectacularly rapid, one of the most rapid observed of any population up to that point in the world. And even now, our fertility remains higher than Pākehā, just above replacement, but with the younger age patterning, as Moana Rariri is showing in her PhD thesis around Māori fertility, other Indigenous peoples have had similar transitions, Indeed, one might argue that there's something distinctive to Indigenous peoples' demographic transitions, which is obscured in mainstream demographic theory. So demographers and sociologists elsewhere have talked about an ethnic transition, which is a product of prior demographic transitions 
associated with changes in fertility, mortality, marriage, family, longevity and ageing patterns. And today we see the different growth patterns and different age structures in our different ethnic populations. In 2018, the median age, the age at which you have half the population older and half the population younger, for the European population was 41 years. For Māori and Pacific peoples, it was much younger, at 25 and 23 years respectively. For Asian and Middle East and Latin American, African, that MILA category, that crazy MILA category, um, that contains so many different peoples within it. Nevertheless, uh, for those groups, the median age was 31 years. By 2038, the European share in Aotearoa uh, will drop to 66%, just over two thirds, the lowest since colonisation. Sainz and, our, um, and his collaborators in the States have referred to this ethnic transition as fundamentally the interaction between demography and resources, where those situated at the lower rungs of stratification have lower socioeconomic resources, and this is associated with higher fertility and shorter life expectancies. They say that we need a critical demography to understand the underlying dynamics that generate the reproduction of racism, stratification and inequality. In colonial settler states like Aotearoa, the role of history, historical colonisation and ongoing colonialism are important factors in understanding the dynamics between stratification and demography in this country. In fact, they are more than important factors. They are the underlying drivers of the drivers. And having undertaken a research project that was funded by um, the Swedish Research Council that looks at the role of colonisation in population research and having done a semi-systematic review of the literature, I can say empirically that colonialism very rarely figures as a central explanation in the demography of indigenous peoples. Rather, it is relegated, relegated to a background variable at best. And I can understand why. The C word is not a popular one in demography. It's shifty, imprecise, contentious, an inconvenient reminder of the past. But worse, it's really hard to operationalise in a statistical model. But without it, neither the very different transitions that Māori have had, nor the current situation and structural arrangements of stratification and inequality, without it, they make no sense. So if we are to carry our past into the future with us, we can't conveniently expunge that from our conceptual frames and statistical models. We must put them in the centre. And this isn't just about Māori, it's about all of us. In some ways it's superficial to think that changing demographics will necessarily lead to a change in power arrangements. The sociologist many decades ago, Blaylock, argued that the growth of minority populations threaten the power and the privilege of the dominant white population in the context of the United States. And he also argued uh, that the result of that was that the dominant population set in motion a variety of policies and practices designed to limit the political power and economic possibilities of minority groups. So that while in 2075 in the United States and even, even, even earlier, uh, the dominant white group will become a numerical minority, they will still maintain their dominant and advantaged position. Now, two years on from the Christchurch mosque terror attacks, um, the narratives that we tell ourselves as a country are important. And there is a narrative that racism is on the fringes, um, that it dwells on the periphery and it's not at the centre of who we are as a colonial settler state. I have learnt much on this topic from the critical lens of my colleague, Dr. Aramarata, who will be talking later on in the panel. And some of the work that we have tried to do to understand what's going on at the centre and not just on the periphery has involved looking at some of the uh, population uh, survey data from the New Zealand General Social Survey. Some of you may have seen this slide before and I just want to show a couple of it. We have, we have many more, but I just want to pick out a couple. Um, and this is a question from the NZGSS from 2006 saying that asks, how important is diversity and multiculturalism in defining New Zealand? And how important is Māori culture in defining New Zealand? 
And then if we look at the distributions by ethnic group, we see a really interesting pattern. So if you look first at ethnic differences and the importance of multiculturalism and ethnic diversity, we see here very, very high proportion of Pacific and Asian people in the survey, nearly 90%, felt that um, multiculturalism is, is very important for New Zealand. Māori is reasonably high at 79%, but the group that sees it is at least inclined to see multiculturalism as being important for defining who we are as a country is actually the uh, European uh, ethnic group. Now, if we turn then to Māori culture and, and ethnic differences and the proportion that believe Māori culture is very important for defining who we are as a country. We see that Māori, of course, yes, 90% of Māori think Māori culture is very important for defining Aotearoa. Pacific peoples, 82%. Asian peoples, the majority of who are overseas born, 76%. But again, the lowest proportion who see Māori culture as significant for our country as a European population. Now, this is you know, nationally representative data. This is not a poll that's just taken by our lunchroom <laughs> and students. So we can generalise from this to say that it's actually tapping something that's real. And there's a number of other results from different surveys and studies that we've done that will support this, will support this data here. So, in the remaining time that I have left, I just want to leave that, and I think we'll pick up on this theme later on in our migration panel, but in the remaining time that I have left, I just want to return to the main theme of our ancestors um, in our mokopuna and tell the story of our ancestors in our mokopuna through the lens of the past and the present. And where I'll start here is with Tipa. Tipa is our eponymous ancestor of our hapu Ngāti Tipa. Um, sometimes people don't really understand that these are real people that lived. <laughs> Um, we've been constructing our, our whakapapa and our hapu through a Marsden project and, um, and once you reconstruct your whakapapa back to your eponymous ancestor, it all becomes very real. And so Tipa lived around 1650 and had linkages to um, many other hapu in the Waikato, including Ngāti Mahuta, who uh, Kingi Tuhetia and the Kingi Tanga come from, that is their eponymous ancestor, to Pikiao in Te Arawa to Ngāti Pāua, who now reside in Hauraki, to Tamatera and Marutuahu. So that must say some of the important whakapapa genealogical relationships um, that link Ngāti Tipa to other hapu and iwi. So where are Ngāti Tipa? If you follow the, this is from an older 19th century map, if you follow the Waikato Awa uh, through Hamilton, up round the bend, Musa, and it runs out to the Tasman Sea, that is where Ngāti Tipa are where the Tasman, where the Waikato Awa runs out to the Tasman Sea. I came across this picture in one of our wānanga, our whakapapa wānanga, um, a couple of years ago. I'd never seen it before that. I'm not sure if you can see the names underneath that, but the names are Ngā Wairo Kukutai and Tahu Kukutai. Um, <laughs> I had... Um, Actually, never heard of, of these two puna, um, but they were my, my grandfathers, my koros, older sisters. Um, their great 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 grandfather, Kukutai, uh, signed uh, Te Tiriti o Waitangi on behalf of Ngati Tipa. And uh, after the invasion of the Waikato and the confiscation of Waikato lands, Ngati Tipa uh, received 45,000 acres back. Um, through the compensation court, and that land is called the Opuatia block. Now, at that time, uh, Ngā Wairo and uh, Tahu were living on the Opuatia block with my great grandparents and my uh, grandfather, who was yet to come. So, I just want to hold that image of, of Tahu and Ngā Wairo there. Um, they were born in the early 1900s. In Ian's seminal book, Te Iwi Māori, he estimates that life expectation at birth for Māori at the turn of the century was about 30 years. Um, for Pākehā, it was almost double. Indeed, as Woodward and Blakely have shown in their book, A Healthy Country, between 1870 and 1940, Pākehā enjoyed the lowest mortality in the world. This wasn't the case for my tūpuna, my namesake. Uh, they died as young girls in 1914. I found a newspaper article 
of their father, my great-grandfather, giving testimony in a court. And what had happened is they had become very, very ill, and he had sought the, the help and intervention of a Pākehā, an English um, retired midwife who lived in, in Te Pūaha amongst the Ngāti Tipa people. And she had provided him with sort of remedies, um, which were later found to, to be stuff that she had just mixed up. Um, but she was doing this and she was charging Māori in the area um, quite significant fees because they were desperate and they wanted to save their children. Uh, so Tahu and uh, Ngāwairō died and there are many graves of young uh, children in our urupa up at Te Kohanga. And the midwife was charged and um, sentenced to hard labour and fined. So in terms of carrying the past with us um, and looking back to the, the Spanish influenza, in 1918. The death rates for Māori were seven times higher than for Pākehā. The devastation in this part of the country was immense and in partly led to Te Puia moving to Tūranga Waiwai and Ngāroa Wahi and founding a new community there. But there was a lot going on with the land as well. It wasn't just the people and I just want to read a letter that was written uh, by my great-great-grandfather's cousin in 1895 to the Herald. At that time, the Ōpūtia block was intact. It had been um, allocated to Ngāti Tipa in 1868, and through various means, they had managed to keep it intact for nearly 30 years. Um, so in this letter to the Herald, my tūpuna writes, this is my question to you. Can the government break the law? We native owners of Ōpūtia have found Europeans who agree to, leave our, who agree to lease our land and the rent and all agreements have been arranged between us and these Pākehā. We have chosen our committee and waited now a long time to give effect to the lease. The law says we are to form a committee and the committee is to sign the lease. We wish to deal with our land according to the law, but the Minister of Land says no, he won't agree to private dealings. Now this is my question. Is the Minister stronger than the law? We Māori always thought Ministers were appointed to carry out the law. We hear a great talk of their wanting to settle people on the land, but it is all gammon. <laughs> I didn't know that word existed then. Um, we can put 150 settlers on our land, or Puatia, in a few weeks if they will let us. But the government blocked the way, like a great stone in the road. And they say, you Māoris must sell your land for five shillings an acre, land which is worth two dollars an acre and more. They will give us the five shillings an acre but give Pākehā in the other island, Waipounamu, five pounds to ten pounds an acre. And yet, they talk of one law for both races. Let there be one law for both races. And let the minister obey the law. Why should he seek to stop us by idle talk when he has no more power to do so than he has to stop your Pākehās leasing your lands? Sufficient. I like that ending. There's a few emails where I think I could end it. Sufficient. Was he successful? No. So the work that uh, one of our PhD, Nidia PhD graduates, Jesse Whitehead, has done for us, linking up our uh, 19th century historical maps and uh, land titles from Lynn's, basically a massive exercise in whakapapa and whenua data repatriation, uh, linkage and interpretation, has shown that, oops, this is very suspenseful. I, I can see it on my screen, but you can't see it, can you? <laughs> oh, that's really frustrating. Um, I don't know how to get around that. Um, I don't think it's going to work. Someone up here will come and come up here and do it. I'll have to describe it for you. Basically, what it shows is um, a map of. Ah, do you want to stay there? Thank you my magic helper. This is the map that uh, the GC recreated of the original Ōpūtia block, the 45,000 acres owned by Ngāti Tipa. Um, and he's, by, he's shown the um, amount of land alienation by decade. And uh, the, dark, the dark red shows alienation from uh, the 1890s, and as it gets lighter, it goes through the decades. But there's really two key points here. And the first key point is the dark red 
represents alienation in the 1890s. So my tūpuna was writing this letter in 1895. Mass alienation began in 1896. By the end of the, 90, the 1890s, two-thirds of the Ōpūtia bloc had been alienated. Um, in one case, it was 17,000 acres went literally in one day to the government. The blue, the second key point of this is the blue. The blue is what we currently have. It's 5% of the Ōpūtia bloc. So despite living on the land, um, despite planning for the land, despite appeals to even-handedness from the politici politicians of the day, uh, despite uh, strong attempts to retain mana mutuhake over our land, the blue is what we have today. Now I want to fast forward, I know I'm running out of time to Oh, no, I don't know where the next slide's gone. Eh, let's dis disregard that. What I wanted to do was fast forward to Tahu in the present. And I had this really nice photo of me and my cousin, my tuakana, Nga Wairo, holding a picture of our namesakes, Tahu and Nga Wairo. And we're in our family house in Turanga Waiwai that our grandfather had built. Because our great-grandparents left their homes, what land they had left in Ōpūtia, and they came with Te Pūia to establish Tūranga Waiwai in the wake of influenza that had decimated our people. She needed workers. This wasn't welcomed by Pākehā in the township. As Whaia Ngāhuia knows, they rallied against the Pūia's plan to revive the Kingitanga and make a new home in Ngāruawa here. I was born in Wellington. My dad was born in Tūranga Waiwai Marae, but he moved to Wellington, along with many others who migrated to the towns and cities. I was part of the Generation X, born in an urban area. At that time, the life expectancy of a Māori girl born in 1971, yes, that's how old I am, 50 soon, <laughs> had a life expectancy of 65 years compared to a non-Māori baby girl, my neighbour, 75 years. She had a 10-year start on me, so I had to learn to run fast. I was one of two Māori in the school. I wasn't able to speak the deal because my father, a native speaker, was beaten for doing so at school. We've got a photo on our photo album of the 1975 land march that was started by Fina Cooper up into Hapua, and it ended in Wellington. And there's a photo of my dad there with my brother perched on his shoulders. He wasn't going to miss it. In 1980, we returned to Ngāru Wahia, the Tūranga Waiwai, to the place, uh, to our home, and in a way it was inevitable, the return. Um, I went to school on the town side. There's two sides in Ngāru Wahia, the town side and the pa side. My whakapapa was on the pa side, but I went to school on the town side. Um, half of the school was Māori, but there was no single Māori teacher, just a dental nurse. She was terrifying. <laughs> My new best friend had a two-storey home with three toilets and a pool. And my nine-year-old self tried to process, process this against the reality of my grand-aunt's whare on the Papakainga at Tūranga Waiwai, which still had a long drop in 1980. And we used a tin bath to bathe on the patio and hope that the, the Joseph boys up the, up the hill didn't walk past when you were having a bath. <laughs> so that was Tahu in the present. And if I think about Tahu in the future, 2100, I like to imagine, maybe it's a holograph of a mokopuna mokopuna holding a picture of Tahu and Ngā Wairo, holding a picture of Tahu and Ngā Wairo. <laughs> Who knows, with artificial intelligence, anything's possible. There's a lot of uncertainty, but what we do know about our population futures here in Aotearoa is that we will be older, we will be more diverse. Uh, with the end of growth, we probably will be fewer. We know that with our whenua, there are massive challenges. Climate changes with global warming, rising sea levels, more frequent droughts and floods. The technology and digital revolution is already upon us, intruding into our lives in granular detail, real-time mass surveillance, the legal settings have not caught up. The ability to opt out of digital technologies, networks, tracing surveillance and databases is hard. There's a lot of talk about uh, adaptation to what is coming. 
and Francis is right. Demography is not destiny. We must adapt, but we must not accept that, which is patently wrong. And we must push back against the discourse of demography as destiny, inequality as destiny, uh, climate devastation as destiny. Living lightly, living smartly, living distinctively, living well with dignity and opportunity. That is the whenua that I want for my mokopuna in 2100. Kia ora.